Welcome to Season 3 of Voices of Australia, where we embark on a journey through the heart of social cohesion. In this thought-provoking podcast series, we delve into the diverse tapestry of Australian society, weaving together the stories, experiences and perspectives that contribute to our nation's unity. From conversations with community leaders and experts in their fields, to personal narratives of everyday Australians, Voices of Australia Series 3 explores the challenges and triumphs of fostering social cohesion in a dynamic and ever-evolving society. Whether you're a seasoned advocate for social harmony or just beginning to explore the nuances of Australian identity, this podcast invites you to listen, learn and engage in the vital dialogue surrounding social cohesion. Professor Harper is one of Australia's best known economists, having worked with governments, banks and corporates at the highest level, held a number of prestigious academic positions, authored numerous academic and industry publications, served on various boards and advisory bodies and been sought out as a public commentator. In May 2016, he was appointed to the board of the Reserve Bank of Australia and recently chaired the federal government's competition policy review, the Harper Review, of Australia's competition policy laws and regulators. A partner at Deloitte Access Economics from 2011 to 2016, Harper has also held various other roles, including at the Melbourne Business School, where he was elected Emeritus Professor, the Australian Fair Pay Commission, where he was inaugural chairman, the Victorian Government's Independent Review of State Finances, where he was a member, and the Advisory Board of the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in Australia, where he was a member. He is a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and a Distinguished Public Policy Fellow of the Economic Society of Australia. With his opinion sought on a vast array of topics ranging from market economics, privatisation, deregulation, taxation, globalisation and economic issues of the day, Harper's skill lies in combining his academic strength, business acumen and common sense with a talent for communication and principled debate. So Ian, welcome. It's a, an absolute pleasure to have you here. I have... Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you mm. multiple times, but in actual fact, mm. this is the first time I've had a chance to really interview you. But we asked you to come and talk to us about trust and social cohesion, because for many people, I think trust, well, you know, trust is absolutely essential to the well-being of society. Mm. Um, if people don't actually understand how important those interrelationships are and or don't invest in them, then often a lot of things fall apart. Yes. What... Um, what they may not necessarily know is how important trust is, trust in institutions, trust in other people, to our economic well-being. And, um, and in many situations where there are societies of high levels of trust, then the economy tends to do particularly well. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about why that was the case. Well, I do. But first up, thank you for having me, Anthea. Anthea, it's really uh, terrific to be here. So, yes, indeed... Um, uh, trust is an essential element of what drives economies, makes them successful. Uh, when you break it right down to its basic level, uh, what makes us economically prosperous is exchange. Mm. So we specialise in particular things we do well or that we have access to, and then we exchange those for other things. Now, that process of exchange obviously involves human relationships, even in the internet age. It requires us to relate one to the other. And if we have trust in each other as we engage in that relationship, then a whole lot of necessary, if you like, supporting infrastructure uh, isn't required. Um, if we don't have that trust, then we have to surround this exchange with a whole panoply of regulatory or legal interventions, which are essentially desi designed to try to substitute for the trust that we otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. So in short, the more we trust each other, the more we can do, as it were, business on a handshake. Yeah. And um, the less we trust each other, it may even come to the stage that we can't exchange at all. And that's where the economic cost really goes up. Hmm. And it's um, there. So I, I wanted to. I, there was a piece in the Guardian this morning that I just wanted to. That Julianne Schultz wrote, and I just wanted to to quote a little bit about it, in, in which he talks about individual dreams, collective imagination, and a shared sense of belonging is even harder to corral in a winner takes all world of politics, information, and culture shaped by the socially disengaged global attention economy. Better to dream small, keep your focus close on your family, your work, your 
community. For most people, much of the time this works. It privatises belonging, but encourages public cynicism. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about, um, about that in relation to trust. That, that Do you think that people are actually just working more on their level of trust within the, the very near uh, com communities in which they operate rather, and being far more cynical about the economy at a, at a macro level? Well, I suspect that that might be happening. Uh, and people do naturally focus on those areas where they believe they do have trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, traditionally, at least one's family and neighbours and people you can see and meet on an everyday basis, uh, those are people that it's much easier to develop the trusting relationships with. Yeah. I think that's fine. Uh, the second part, which is therefore I should close <laughs> the door or the window to the world, that doesn't yeah. seem right at all. And, um, you know, just think about our own circumstances again in Australia. Uh, the, you know, the Europeans arrived here. Uh, indigenous Australians, of course, have been here for a long, long time, but it, Europeans arrived and in the first little while couldn't feed themselves. They were reliant upon imports of food. Mm -hmm. And this economy in the intervening more than 200 years has grown on the basis of its trading relationships. You know, we are a small, open trading economy. Yeah. And so for us simply to close the door on the world would impose enormous economic costs on us. Uh, and okay, fine, then how do we make those relationships work? Well, you've got to work on the trust. Yeah. Uh, Australians are notoriously great travellers because of our distance, and a lot of that travel is business travel, and the internet and email and, and you know, online video conferencing notwithstanding, uh, people will still go for the sake of being able to shake a hand, look someone in the eye when it comes to making a business deal. Really important. Yeah. Is it hard? Yes. Is it harder than simply talking to your neighbours or your family? Well, of course it is. But is it required? Well, yes, it's required for our prosperity. And not just economic prosperity, it's required for our growth as human beings. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's it's particularly interesting to think about the role that um, that the internet or, or the, the narratives that tend to flow around, uh, whether they actually have this sort of impact in, in making the economy and making people's understanding of how um, our economy works to their benefit or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of separating it out in some respects that people don't necessarily see. Where you talked originally about this is about exchange yeah. and we all do exchange. Yes. But for some reason or other, there's, there's, um, there's been this gap about understanding that the economy is that simple component, but actually um, the complexity that people seem to be talking more about and the fact that it's not in your best interests tends to have created a bit of a gulf in that, um, that trust equation. Well, I, I'm not doubting that that has occurred and theory, I, I think it's, um, well, this is a misunderstanding, right? Yeah. And I think to, that, to the extent to which digital technology has distanced us from that sort of fundamental human exchange element, mm -hmm. then yeah, it, it's, it's entirely possible that we sort of forget that these things are connected. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, I don't know that the advent of the internet and electronic transfers and well, I mean, really hasn't made a difference to the way yeah. commerce is done. And in fact, it, it's enhanced our capacity to do business with all sorts of people around yeah. the world doing all sorts of things as people who order stuff online, <laughs> you know, could readily attest. Yes. Uh, but it, it is much easier for you to think, well, somehow or other there's a black box, right, rather than behind this being the lives of people. Yeah. Uh, and, and at the same time as what you've described, I'm sure is true, it's also true particularly with younger people, that they want to know where these things have come from. And they, they talk about provenance, right? Yeah. That they want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, t the same technology can actually deliver that for you, tell you precisely where this thing you're about to eat, right, has yeah. come from, what you're about to wear has come from. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the technology can serve us being more intimately knowledgeable, if not actually meeting the people, but having some sense that they have lives and challenges and, and issues to deal with uh, in the same way that we do. And oftentimes, of course, they can be more difficult circumstances. Yeah. The same technology can bring that to your, 
to your attention. Oh, absolutely. Do you, um, so you, you um, have been the Dean of the Melbourne Business School. Have, have you seen an evolution within students' understanding of um, sort of the impact of the work that they might be starting to, the journey that they might be on? Uh, are you seeing them becoming more aware of these complexities or do you think they're coming from a place where they want um, want their education to help give them a, an answer at the end or this is the way you do it and you'll you'll end up in this particular place? Well, I think my experience, Anthea, is that the people of the, over the time during which I was teaching at the school, which was nearly 30 years, I, mm -hmm. I can see this broadening of people's perspectives and that at the outset, and that would be true of my own education, if you like, there's a particular objective, you know, whether it's profit maximization or whether it's achieving economic efficiency or whatever that you would go for. And you sort of assume that the other things would follow in their train, right? Uh, nowadays, I find that people with, with good reason are much less convinced of that. Oh. And so you, you can't just say, well, yeah, if by doing good, I'll, I'll, by doing well, I'll do good, right? they don't buy that straight away. They'll say, well, it depends exactly what I'm doing well as to whether or not that will do good. And what do we mean by doing good anyway? Um, there's a much greater consciousness of that, of the need to understand that. I don't think that it means that everyone I taught at the business school wants to rush off into the in not-for-profit sector. I think, and neither do I think that people think that doing business is somehow inimical no. uh, to people's welfare. There's not, it's not like that, right? But there's a much greater desire to understand precisely how this serves wider social objectives. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think that's a positive thing, mm -hmm. Anthea. And, and I can, in, in my own upbringing, it was much more separated and that you relied on these separate magisteria to yeah. deal with it, right? So yes, you would run your company, make money within the law, and they let the law sort of do its own thing. That still applies, but there are people thinking, yeah, well, I can run the company, but I could also be doing these other things, the loan just obeying the law, right? Yeah. And, and why would I do that? Well, possibly for my own personal satisfaction, but my employees are demanding that, my customers are demanding that. So I am doing business in a traditional sense, meeting mm -hmm. people's needs, while at the same time uh, satisfying some broader objectives. Yeah. That's clearly much more common nowadays. Yeah, but you had a role at one point in time in looking at the minimum wage mm. and um, whether or not that was fair or not fair. And there were um, times when you made announcements and of course you would get pushbacks from different oh, yeah. directions. What, that, that is such a crucial component of social cohesion. What were the sort of criteria that you used in order to, to figure out exactly where you thought that line should sit? Well, the Act at the time was fairly specific about what it was that we had to do. And, and essentially, well, it didn't make it that much easier, but it did say that we need to set the minimum wage uh, in a way which didn't exacerbate unemployment, right? It didn't induce people to lose their jobs as a result of you know, putting the price too high. Uh, but at the same time, that it was consistent with um, fairness, right? And the a social safety net, right, of which it formed a part. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't be so low, right, that effectively people were induced then just to seek assistance from social security. Yeah. Right? It wasn't worth working. Uh, but neither could it be so high that they get thrown onto the unemployment benefit because they lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't want your listeners or, or viewers to get the impression that somehow I and my colleagues and I had a sort of philosopher's stone and oh, that we no. could determine what, <laughs> what was fair. Well, the, the act at the time was pretty prescriptive and spoke to us about avoiding those two things. Yeah. Right? I, I guess where I'm coming from is, is during COVID, mm. the, um, the uh, job seeker and job keeper that was put in place mm. had a dramatic impact yes. on people's views of government and yes. their level of trust in government yes. went up very, very high. Exactly. So, so being in a position where you had to yeah. give a lot of thought yes. as to what that should look like in, in a steady state environment, yeah. not out, you know, outside of a pandemic, yeah. is, is a very challenging role to have. And I would imagine you were abundantly aware, as you've clearly articulated, what the impact of that would be on social cohesion, on the, the just the, um, the well-being of, of our society yeah. as a whole. Yeah. So, but on top of that, you're, you're a person of faith. Mm. And so I imagine that there's 
some components, and and I'm interested in your view as to where, how does how does faith for anybody, not simply just for you, mm. sort of help to to build in social cohesion? How does it help to influence um, people's views about um, familiarity, about trust, about bringing people together, um, and and making sort of some of those hard decisions that people have to make? Well, I'd like to say, and as a Christian, I think that mm -hmm. that, that stands uh, or falls on one's view about the personhood of the other person you're dealing with. Yeah. Now, the traditional Judeo-Christian view is that each person is created in God's image. And so, in a sense, however you present yourself, uh, whatever you've done, whoever you are, rich, poor, um, of one race or another or whatever, that someone of faith, of the Judeo-Christian Judeo faith, and this is shared by other faiths as yeah. well, will, will, will see you, right? That's the starting point. Mm -hmm. And if that's the starting point, Anthea, then, then there is a call for, ex for respect, for acceptance and inclusion. And, um, you know, as you know, just again to speak about Christianity, um, you know, the author of that faith, Jesus Christ, scandalized his community by associating with people who were regarded at the time as beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did that deliberately as a way, well, in fact, he actually said, I, you know, the Son of Man comes to heal the sick, right? <laughs> Not the well. So yeah. these are people who are being cast out. These are the ones I will associate with and dine with. And, and why? Well, because they too are made in God's image and they're loved by God. Yeah. So given that you start there, then you're thinking, okay, to what extent do these different things, as you say, setting minimum wages or other things that I've done teaching students and so forth, being an economist, how does that serve the dignity of individual people? Mm -hmm. And to come back to the setting of fair, fair pay, one of the things that the Act required us to do was to interview people, right? to actually build the decision based upon consultation. Yeah. And I'd have to say, Anthea, that one of the most moving things that I've probably done is to talk to people who were unemployed for lengthy periods of time or who were operating, working in very low paid jobs. Uh, people criticised me when I was appointed and say, well, what would an academic know about people living on the margins of low pay? Well, that's a good question. Uh, probably not much. Mm -hmm. So how do you fix that? You go and ask them, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And when I was criticised, I'd say, when was the last time you spoke to an unemployed person? People stopped asking me that question. Right? Most people don't tend to do that unless they have someone in the family. But when you do talk to people, as you would expect, very quickly you learn of the dignity which is there. The circumstances are often very, very hard, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes bad luck, sometimes poor decisions, right? Sometimes a combination of the two, but never without dignity. Uh, nor, in fact, oftentimes without understanding the circumstances uh, that they're in and describing, you know, yeah. how they could be assisted or not. These, these terms, personhood, dignity, respect, those, those sorts of elements it's, are so important in building social cohesion that we all should approach each other from, from that particular basis. Well, well I, I believe that fervently. And, and you, know, you asked me what is a word what my faith informs, not just that, but other things. That, but it does inform that. Yeah. That's very, very essential to what we believe. And, and you're right, Anthea, that then you see uh, you could come with all sorts of other identities. And that's, that's perfectly valid. But you, know, you come to me with a particular sexuality or gender or race or political persuasion or whatever it could be. And all of those things are attributes of who you are, at least for the present, you know, sometimes they endure, sometimes they, they yeah. change. But I don't see any of those things as summing you up completely. Right? They aren't you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you might be a number of these things and have these yeah. different attributes. But um, in your essence, there is a person there and that person has dignity, because at least in my faith world, uh, you're created and loved by God. Yeah. So what's my responsibility? Well, it's to start by respecting you. Right? Now, we don't have to become the great friends. That's, some, that's a totally different thing. But to respect you and to seek your good, which is what I take loving my neighbour to mean, right? That I seek your welfare and your yeah. good. 
And, and why do I do that? For the same reason I just gave you. And I might not agree with your politics, I might not, you know, all the other things are quite, but well, there's nothing you know, there. And, and when the church is doing its job properly, if I may say so, right, that, that's where you see all of these folk, you know, mixed in and accepted and, and, and drawn together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I might say that that's, you know, if you like, when I'm off involved with my church world as opposed to my professional world, and Thea, you would be unsurprised that, that I mix with people there whom I would never come across in any other professional context. Mm -hmm. Never, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And yet, it's good for me. <laughs> it's, I hope, good for them that we are thrust into situations where I have to have conversations and try to help and understand people's circumstances who ordinarily I'd have nothing to do yes. with. And this is one of the great benefits that faith actually brings is, is that ability to bring people together from a cross section right. of, of society. Mm -hmm. And it does reinforce that sense of, um, of, of why people do have a, a sense of trust within their community, within their family, within the things that they interact with on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. If I get, to, though, sort of to, to pull this out to a, a broader level and, and assume it's some anonymous government, what do you think the things are that government could actually do to help foster this degree of familiarity, of respect, of dignity of others uh, within the broader population? What, what tools do you think they have to build that social cohesion? Well, I think it's a very important question. And I think one things, thing that governments need to do, right, is not to stand in the way of what I call mediating institutions. Right? Might be a fancy term. Some people who are listening might think, oh, he means clubs and societies. That's exactly what he means, right? He means other forms of association where we come together, people of very different backgrounds and opinions, but we have a, a reason for gathering for this reason. And the obvious example in this city here in Melbourne is, the, is a football club, mm -hmm. for example. And, and you know, at least as well as I do, Anthea, that there are people who have totally different social backgrounds and professional backgrounds. They'll be sitting side by side, <laughs> screaming for their team at the same game. That's a wonderfully effective social mm -hmm. mixer. Uh, okay, so what's, uh, where does the obstacle stand? Well, you know, it could be tax rules. It could be rules about uh, public liability insurance. It could be all these types of things. Not going to affect the AFL that much, but they certainly could affect the local pony club, right? Mm -hmm. Or the local tennis club, or walking club, or bird, bird watching club. Yeah. You need the government to protect, not to stand in the way of that. And, and in some cases, the functions are performed by the government. And we have a long history in this country, for example, of you know, government schools sitting alongside faith-based based schools or just independent schools, mm -hmm. uh, public hospitals, private hospitals, right? I think governments need to, to, to understand that, yes, even though we could in fact do these things, and we do do these things, right? That is not a reason to say, okay, we're just gonna swamp the private sector with a publicly offered uh, alternative. Mm -hmm. As citizens of the state, we relate to one another in another dimension, right? So we're voters and supporters of government and, and such like. That's all great, yeah. but we, we don't have to relate to each other in that way in every other single dimension. So I think preserving what some people call civil society, protecting civil society, which stands between the individual, so it stands between me just looking after myself, yeah. right? And the state, which then says, okay, I'm looking after you, right, with the power of the state. In between the two of them is civil society, mediating institutions, whatever term you like. Mm -hmm. So my answer to you there, ma'am, is to say, the state needs to not think that it can just um, override these other institutions. You, you don't need them because you have the state, right? That's not healthy. So it's almost reinforcing the fact that collaboration which needs to happen to build familiarity actually needs to happen between the state and civic institutions and the individuals yes. in order to, to build these systems of social cohesion. Well, I, I think that's right. I think that each, each institution, obviously the state, right, mm -hmm. but these mediating institutions also have the same characteristic. They call us to something which is beyond ourselves, right? They involve us in some type of civic activity which takes me out of myself and confronts me with people who, oh, they're different from me and I don't like this and I don't like that, but hey, right, they enjoy bird watching like I do, or 
they enjoy football like I do or something else. Yeah. So, so I find some bridge, right, that, in the, that then induces me to act with them for some common objective, yeah. even though I wouldn't take them home to mother. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. and and the state has its function. So yes, then I'll in, I'll engage with my fellow citizens in deciding, you know, what we ought to do about immigration or or you know some other major public policy issue. Then I'm into I'm having a political discussion. I'm in the polis with my citizens, yeah. my fellow citizens. That's also important. I'm called beyond myself. They're both sitting over against the individual who says, well, I am an island and I'm not having anything to do with anybody else, it's just me. You know, yeah. We can't build any type of society based on that. But yeah. neither can we build a society where the state simply says, you don't need anybody else but me. Right? That, that's 1984. Yeah. But it does highlight the value of the state being able to articulate a vision mm. whereby people can better understand how all of these different elements actually play a part oh. in taking us in that direction of that's that right. vision. Exactly. That, that is why I think it is important for the state to say, well, of course, you know, there are, uh, let's take hospitals, there are public hospitals, right? And at the end of the day, with universal health care, if you need health care, doesn't matter who you are, I mean, yes, you will be looked yeah. after, right? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't support a thriving private hospital system, health care, aged care, whatever, yeah. which, is, which is allowing people who might be motivated, as is in the case, for instance, of the Catholic health system, by other faith-based objectives, right? But they too want to provide these health services, and will do, and you know, the state, I think, needs to support that within the constraints that are imposed by the citizens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it is, um, we've just, well, not just, but we've gone through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. There have been other economic shocks along the way, recessions and, and, uh, and it, it, incidents that occur at a, at a global level, not necessarily within Australia, but they, they send reverberations mm -hmm. in, in our general direction. But somehow or other, Australia continues to be a really quite cohesive mm -hmm. society. Have you got any thoughts as to why you think Australia is a, re is a, a cohesive society, given all of those different things that happen along the way? Well, I suspect that there's more than one reason for that. But, but the reason I'm going to point to in this conversation, Anthea, is our public institutions. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we have a high degree of trust in the public institutions. Okay. And as somebody who's served on a, a number of them, uh, when I ask myself, you know, why I serve in that role, it's for that reason. Mm -hmm. To do what I can as an individual to ensure that these public institutions are held in as high a regard as they possibly can be. Doesn't mean that they don't make mistakes. Certainly doesn't mean that they're above being reviewed or called to account by the parliament. On, on the contrary, all of that is entirely healthy, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, I want um, my fellow Australians, ordinary citizens, to be able to say, well, yes, yes, but, you know, as you said, we trust the Reserve Bank to do X, right? Or, you know, we, we, we trust um, the Department of Health or whatever it might be. Yeah. Australians, I find, um, have a, maybe not disrespect, but they're, they're, they have a, they're not always very fond of their politicians and the, and the political process, let's put it that way. But the distinction between the political process and, if you like, the machinery of government, right, I think there's a very different relationship there. And you mentioned before the uh, job keeper through, mm -hmm. the, through the pandemic. Well, I'm very, I wasn't involved personally, but I was very close to it, um, given that I was on the board of the Reserve Bank at that time. And I pay tribute to my professional colleagues, my professional economist colleagues, who advise the government, right, that that's what we should do in order to prevent people losing their jobs. They lose their jobs, they lose their houses, and, and, and you don't want to go down that road. No, lose their dignity. Don't want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. So um, we didn't go down that road. And the government of the day uh, paid tribute to them too. They accepted the advice and away we went. And I don't think there's any Australian who regards that as a mistake. We all understand that it's expensive. We all understand we're going to be paying you know, the taxes off over time as we go along to deal with that. But I don't believe anybody would have said, you know what, that was a mistake. We should just let the hindmost fail, right? No one says that. Why not? Because it would be un-Australian to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And for me to be able to say that, for you to nod, you see, there's something there that we're putting our finger on. Yeah. Why is it un-Australian? Because for all the rest of it, we're very different. We have our different aspirations. We can argue over two flies going up a wall. But when it comes down to, and tragically, we've seen this play out again just in this past week, if you're in danger, 
right, I will come to help. Yeah. Right? Yep, absolutely. You, you thrust your baby into my arms, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And, yeah. and so w we need to keep refurbishing and, and feeding these wells of goodwill that we have. And, and a lot of that is allowing us to express our differences. So no, I don't have to be exactly like you. That's not the point, right? Yeah. And I, in fact, I might disagree with you about a whole bunch of things. But if your house is burning down, I'm coming to help, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the type of thing. We've yeah. got to hang on to that. And I think that, that when you ask where it comes from, it's a complex mix, I'm sure. What role can government play? Well, it can reinforce these wells by encouraging the type of community involvement and engagement, yeah. independently of our political activity. Not to say that's not important, mm -hmm. but independently of that, yeah. which helps build the rest of it, right? So that it would be, yeah, the passing lifesaver, that the person who is, you know, has another responsibility suddenly doing these things yeah. because of the opportunity and because of the innate sense, there's a fellow human being who needs my help and needs my help now, right? Yeah. Mm. So you, um, as we touched on before, um, have taught students for quite some number of years. What is it that you think is really important to pass on to students, regardless really of what they're studying, but assume they're economic students, um, to ensure that you think they come at their role, whatever it might be, at whatever level or, or place within society, that they understand the role that they have in contributing to social cohesion? Well, I've always said that privilege carries responsibility. And uh, all of the students that I've taught at you know, what is currently the nation's top university mm -hmm. uh, are privileged students. And I don't mean necessarily financially or socially privileged, some of them are, yeah. uh, but they are privileged by virtue of their intellect, their abilities, uh, their aspirations. And so I say that's all terrific, right? And now that privilege carries a responsibility and it's that it's not all about you. Right? Yeah. So whether you're going to, if you're going to build, uh, you know, startups and, uh, that are going to make a lot of money, or that's what you hope they'll do, terrific, but they need to serve <laughs> the people who, who are their cl customers, people who work for them, yeah. maybe a large organisation, maybe you're going to go into government, or you could do all sorts of things, you could run organisations, but you're going to do that. And as you do that, you remember, it's not just about you. It's about, uh, and this and this isn't, you know, council to, to um, as it were, turn you into a better person. You can think about it that way. But you can also say it's counsel that you will find this fulfilling. Right? You climb these ladders, you discover they run out of rungs. <laughs> and you're up there and you're thinking, well, I've... now what happens? Well, yeah. you're much less likely to ever ask that question if on the way while you're climbing the ladder, in fact, you're pulling people up, you're making other ladders, you're growing and developing that. Then one day, yes, you'll find yourself at the top of the ladder and you think, oh, well, so much <laughs> for that, right? But you'll have all these other things that have been part and parcel of the journey yeah. to take with you. So I think it's, it's, it's about that. It's not, it's not just about you. Um, if you are if with a privilege, that carries a responsibility and you need to be looking to that yeah. as well. Um, that's probably... And I'm assuming you would encourage them to not only get to know their fellow students and where they come from, because they'll all be coming from different places, yeah. but also to get out there and meet people yeah. um, and not necessarily think of yourself as simply part of that, oh, that well, institution itself. That's so absolutely true. The, 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 that these. example that you gave about having to interview people mm -hmm. to find out more about where they've come from and why they've ended up where they are, yeah. um, just an incredibly important part of social well, it was. cohesion. It was one of the things I thought was the strongest part of the act, to be frank. Yeah. Uh, and it required us to go after the decision had been made as well the next year right? uh. to ask so to talk to the people to face the people who were living with the results of what you had decided right yeah. uh, is a great discipline uh, on let me say people like me right bureaucrats if you like sitting in offices in high places making decisions that affect other people's lives yeah. uh, it's very important for us to have to go and talk to people and say well you know how did that go? <laughs> and of course, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. The, the, the reasonable ones will, will say, well, yeah, but you know, I hated that because of this, 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 and this. But somebody had to make the decision, and I don't want to make the decision, right? Yeah. Most reasonable people are, are like that. I say, that's fine. Let me, I hear what you have to say. Okay, fine. But no, no, I don't want to make the decision. You make the decision. Uh, and I could, um, again, it gives you a basis for respecting. Yeah. Uh, what people have to say, and, and people will generally speaking treat you with respect as well, which means 
Well, anymore, they think. <laughs> yeah, so we're back to personhood, dignity, respect. Um, it, and, and in actual fact, another aspect that you just pointed out was that people want to be heard. Mm. They, they want to have that opportunity to have a voice. Yes. They don't necessarily want to make the decisions, but they want you to listen. Yes. Oh, yes, I, I was uh, told that by uh, former Premier Bob Carr, former oh. Foreign Minister Bob Carr, <laughs> whose advice and counsel I sought at one point about this. And he yeah. said, I'm sure he won't mind my quoting him, uh, he said, Ian, he said, in my political experience, he says, 95% of the people, right, will be reasonable in the way they deal with you. So about half of them will agree with you, half of them won't, <laughs> right? He said, but um, they will all, uh, whether they agree with you or whether they don't, they will value the fact that they were asked. Right? Yeah. And those who don't agree with you will probably go and tell their mates, I told the guy, rah, 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 yeah. right? And, and, what, and did he listen? Well, he went and did that, you know, that's yeah. it. But I told him. Yes. And, and the fact that you've listened and you've heard that, Bob said to me, you know, you will get, people will support you if they disagree with you. I found him to be right about that. And of course, his own political career, based up, presumably upon that uh, maxim, uh, yeah. speaks for itself. Absolutely. Uh, Ian, it, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about social cohesion and economics. I think often people don't necessarily think of the two in the same yes. subject, but, uh, but I think you've done a wonderful job in highlighting exactly how trust social cohesion, economics, they are all a, a part of one and, uh, and it's a, an important conversation to have. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, Anthea, for the opportunity. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to our Voices of Australia podcast. For more episodes like this one, you can visit the Scanlon Institute website at scanlaninstitute, or one word, .org .au.